Okay. All right. This is more fucking wonderful technology. Okay. Oh. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully everybody will join me on this on this one. I don't know why the upcoming event didn't work. I have no idea why it wouldn't go live, but apparently I just clicked go live and it worked just fine. So let's see. Nate G, do you have specifics on the energy required for osmosis? I'm not quite sure what you mean on the energy required for osmosis, other than that osmosis and diffusion both require energy because, <clears throat> excuse me, what's happening is that during osmosis or diffusion, if you're in diffusion, you have a solute going down a concentration gradient from high concentration to low concentration. Well, water is really similar, right? So water is diffusion or osmosis is diffusion for water. So what happens is water will move from high potential to low potential, but water is moving. That's important. If something's moving, it's got kinetic energy. So that's why diffusion and osmosis both require energy, but you don't have to add any energy. It uses potential energy and the kinetic energy that's already in the system. I hope that answers your question. And you can think of uh, concentration gradients as potential energy. Just put a ball on top of a hill. I got my notepad here. Yay. Let's see how this works. I will raise this. Okay. You got a hill. You put your ball up on top of the hill. It will roll down the hill. So it's got potential energy at the top of the hill. And that potential energy gets converted to kinetic energy as it goes downhill. So as things go down their concentration gradient, what they're doing is they're going downhill and they're using kinetic energy. So once again, diffusion and osmosis they do not require an input of energy. The cell doesn't have to spend ATP, but um, they use the energy already present in the system. Let me go to the next question. Why can't prokaryotes carry out phagocytosis? You know, that's a fantastic question. First of all, phagocytosis is basically, ah, I got my, I was recommended to do this the other night. You take a cell like this, and it's going to, engulf another cell okay so to carry this out to move your membrane around like this you need to have a cytoskeleton that's capable of moving your membrane and you can't be surrounded by a cell wall either so in eukaryotic cells are the only types of cells that we know that can carry out phagocytosis because they have the microtubules right Whoa, that spelled really good. And they have actin filaments that allow them to do that. Now, prokaryotes, they have a cytoskeleton, but as far as we know, they don't have a cytoskeleton that can allow it to swallow another cell. And the other thing that limits these guys are um, they don't have energy. Enough, well, they have energy. And prokaryotes make enough energy to be a prokaryote. But to carry out phagocytosis, not only do you need a complex cytoskeleton, microtubules, and actin filaments, you need a lot of ATP to do that. Whereas prokaryotes only make all their ATP across their membrane, eukaryotes are full of mitochondria, so they can produce a lot of ATP to carry out such an energy-intensive process. Okay, hopefully that answered your question. I'm going to go next. 
How do cells store potential energy across their membrane? Okay, that's a good question. Let's see. Oh, that'll work. Magic hands. Okay. We got a membrane. And membranes, if you remember, have selective permeability. And every single cell on this planet pumps sodium out of the cell, and they pump potassium ions in the cell. And um, a lot of cells, in fact, I think almost every cell also does this. They also pump protons. I didn't talk about that in class, but they pump protons across that membrane as well. Okay, so this creates what we call an electro chemical gradient okay i got a chemical gradient because i got more sodium and hydrogen on this side and then i've got more potassium on this side so that creates a chemical gradient these things are out of equilibrium they want to be in equilibrium you can think of this membrane as like a dam right you have a dam and water fills up behind the dam and then because the water is behind the dam and it's got all this potential energy it wants to go this way to reach equilibrium here's our dam here's all the water behind it it's storing potential energy. These things have lots and lots of stored energy. Okay. So it's also called an electrical, an electrochemical gradient because these are positively charged ions, and there's a lot more of them out here than here. So we build up a positive charge across this membrane. I know there's not any anions. Well, they're actually chloride. But this negative isn't because you've got anions down here, the negatively charged ions. It's because you have more positive charges on this side relative to that one. So it's like a battery and you have an electrical gradient as well since we have an electrochemical gradient and this stores potential energy just like a battery. And then because we got the chemical gradient, that's storing energy like you would water behind a dam and this being out of equilibrium, they're always trying to go this way to reach equilibrium. And cells can actually harness that through facilitated diffusion to do work. Okay. Jonathan, do we need to know why microvilli are important in the small intestine? Well, uh, yes, you do, actually. Maybe not for this test. I can't remember if I put a test question like that on there, but I have in the past. Microvilli are, are incredibly important in our small intestine. You know, you've got these eukaryotic cells, and um, they have these uh, projections like this. And these are tiny, and what they do is they increase surface area without increasing a lot of volume. And by increasing the surface area, this increases areas that you can have for absorption. That's why they're in your intestines. So even if you don't learn that right now, you're going to need that for plant and animal form and function. And if you take any type of AMP, you'll definitely learn that. Okay. M. Holstein, what limits the size of a prokaryotic cell? Oh, fantastic question. That is not in the book. So I know somebody's asking me, what are we going to need to know that's not in the book? I'm looking for something to wipe. How about a baby bib? Okay. Prokaryotes are small. Eukaryotes are large. We know this. Okay. Here's part of what's right about this. As you get larger, your surface area does not get as large as fast as your volume. So if my surface area, if I got one by one centimeters, my surface area equals one centimeter squared. If I do volume centimeters, I got one cubic centimeter. But if I go two by two, I've got four square centimeters. If I go two by two by two, which is length times width times height, I have eight cubic centimeters, and we can do three by three equals six centimeters squared. If I go three by three by three, I've got 27 centimeters cubed. So you go one, four, six, and now you're going one, eight, 27. So you can see that the volume gets much larger, much more quickly than the surface area. Now, the historical uh, reason that you see limiting prokaryotes from becoming this size is they talk about diffusion across the membrane. But as you get so large, 
that, that slows down the diffusion to reach the membrane. You know, that's actually true if you're the size of an animal. So if this was a cell and an animal is the size of my room, it would matter. But there are animals, multicellular organisms, that survive just fine relying on diffusion. Diffusion at the level of these cells, which is just a few hundred, you know, uh, micrometers across, micrometers, micrometers, I don't know. Uh, this might even be, you know, like 100. This might even be, you know, a few hundred. This is about 50 or so, maybe a little bit less. The point is diffusion in no way limits this cell to getting stuff across it and to everywhere it needs. And in fact, a water molecule, uh, a carbon dioxide molecule, an oxygen molecule could move across the largest of, of eukaryotic cells within milliseconds. So diffusion in no way limits the size of these cells. Here's what does. It's energy production. Nope, you can't see that. It's huh, energy production. God, man, my handwriting looks so bad in the mirror, I mean, in the uh, camera. Prokaryotic cells, like every cell, makes the majority of their ATP through a process called chemiosmosis. This is the secret to life, is chemiosmosis. Okay? Now, all these prokaryotes, they make air their ATP right across the membranes. Okay? That's where they're making it. Now, as they get larger, what happens is their volume does get big really fast, and they make less and less ATP for the cell. Whereas in eukaryotic cell... We know that we have mitochondria in here making all the ATP. And a eukaryotic cell could have anywhere between, you know, a few tens of mitochondria. Some eukaryotic cells have millions of mitochondria. So as your eukaryotic cell gets larger and larger and larger, you just add more and more mitochondria to make ATP for energy. Whereas if you're a prokaryotic cell, you're only making ATP across your outer membrane. You get larger. You run out of the ability to produce enough ATP. So with it's energy production that limits the size of a prokaryotic cell. Okay. Let's see here. Where are we? Why other than ATP are mitochondria important? Well, mitochondria do a lot of things for us. They are responsible for aging because they create free radicals. They are and they create oxidative stress over time. The evolution of mitochondria led to the evolution of sexual reproduction, and it led to the evolution of two sexes. So there's male and female. Thank you, mitochondria. Mitochondria are also important in some types of infertility. There are times when uh, a woman cannot conceive because there's problems with her mitochondria. There's also mitochondrial diseases that can lead to problems with low energy. Uh, mitochondria are also important for programmed cell death called, most people pronounce it apoptosis, but apoptosis is probably correct. So mitochondria involved with that programmed cell death. So like I said, mitochondria involved with a lot of things in the cell, not just making ATP. And I think I have a slide out there and I've also got a video on YouTube explaining that as well. Okay. How do temperature affect the phospholipids and membranes, and how does this affect permeability? Well, all right, let's think about this. Membranes are made up of phospholipids. They're moving around, okay? Now, what happens is this. You increase the temperature. You increase the rate at which everything moves around. You're increasing thermal energy. So in any membrane, you heat it up, it's going to become more permeable. It's going to become more and more fluid. You cool it down is going to become more and more rigid. So animals, plants, bacteria, everything that's cell membrane, what they have to do is they have to um, acclimate to their environment or adapt by changing the nature of their fatty acid tails. So if you're living in a very warm environment, you have very long and saturated fatty acid tails to help stabilize your membranes to keep it from becoming too fluid. And if you're is a colder and colder and colder environment you, you get, what you'll do then is your, your fatty acid tails become smaller and smaller and more and more unsaturated. Okay. 
Can you explain what the voltage gradient and facilitated diffusion? The voltage gradient. Well, there's an electrochemical gradient, right? So the voltage is created. The voltage is a difference between the plus and the minus end of a cell's membrane or on anything, actually. So as you pump sodium out of the cell here, you got more sodium on the outside of the cell than you have positively charged potassium ions. So the membrane has what we call a voltage. It's called membrane potential for the potential energy that's stored in this. And this is the, the voltage, the difference between these plus charges and, and the charges in here, that represents the millivolts. It's actually measured in millivolts, but it's enough that cells can do a lot of work with that. Okay. Can you explain the role of metabolism in prokaryotes and eukaryotes in relation to oxygen? Okay. So you have what is called a let me just adjust that a little bit. You have what is called aerobic respiration. And aerobic respiration uses oxygen as a final electron acceptor when you powering an electron transport chain. It's something we really haven't talked about too much, but what oxygen allows aerobically respiring cells to do or mitochondria is to extract a lot more energy out of their organic molecules. So when you break down carbohydrates or lipids for energy, if you're using oxygen, you get I don't know, 10 times the amount of energy out of it than you would without using oxygen. Okay. I hope that answers that question. Oh, I lost my place here. Hold on. What is the importance of oligosaccharides in the endomembrane system. Okay, think about this. The endomembrane system is, it does several different things. It, it helps recycle materials, break things down, but it also is involved in the manufacturing processing of molecules. So you're building a protein that goes to the endomembrane system. You know, you, 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 you translate it in the rough ER, it gets folded and packaged, it gets sent to the Golgi body. Now, from the Golgi body, the cell has to know where to send that protein. Do you send it outside the cell? Do you excrete it outside the cell like all the proteins in your saliva? Do you embed that protein into uh, another cellular membrane? Do you put that protein inside of a lysosome? Do you send that protein to the nucleus? Do you send that protein to a peroxisome? So oligosaccharides serve as like a, an address, a postal address that allow the cell to transport these proteins to the right place. And oligosaccharides are also involved, not just in where things go and like determining where they go is a chemical marker. They're also involved with like cell cell recognition. So if you're familiar with like the A, B and O blood system, A and B have to do with different types of oligosaccharides attached to proteins on the surface of your blood. So they're pretty important for like figuring out where everything goes. Okay. What is abiogenesis? Okay, so that's a mouthful, but let's take the word abiogenesis. A means without, bio means life, and genesis means start. So abiogenesis is the origins of life from non-living material, right? So molecules like carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, lipids. They're molecules. They can be really complex molecules, but they are not living. So abiogenesis is the emergence of life as a result of a, of a series of complex chemical reactions leading up to, the, to, to life. So it's life from non-life, basically. Okay. Jack Rogers. Can you explain why a prokaryotic cell did not engulf aerobically respiring bacteria? Well, I've already talked about that, but really briefly, prokaryotes lack the cytoskeleton, including actin filaments and uh, microtubules, and they also lack enough ATP production to actually engulf another cell. I mean, we, we see no bacteria or archaeans anywhere on the planet ever doing that. We see only eukaryotes doing that, only with the amount of ATP they have. So primary endosymbiosis, that is when two eukary I mean, sorry, two prokaryotes merged, uh, a proteobacteria that could aerobically respiring 
and an archaean. The bacteria went inside the archaean. There was no proto-eukaryotic cell. And that was primary endosymbiosis because that formed all of eukaryotes, or the origin of all eukaryotes. Now, when the ancestors to plants acquired chloroplast, all right, that was secondary endosymbiosis, and that was through phagocytosis because the ancestor to plants was a eukaryotic cell. So plant cells have both, you know, all the organelles, they have a nucleus, they have mitochondria, and they have chloroplast. The chloroplast was through a second round of endosymbiosis that was engulfing, but not primary endosymbiosis, which formed the origins of all eukaryotes. Okay. All right. How detailed do you want the drawings of unsaturated, saturated, trans fats, and fatty acids? I know how to draw them. I'd especially know how to draw a phospholipid for this test. That could be important. And I'd also know how to draw a mem uh, phospholipid bilayer too. And I'd also make sure I know the difference between the cell membrane of a archaean and a bacterium because that's important. Okay, when, why does the endomembrane system not include chloroplast or mitochondria? Good question. Okay, so the endomembrane system evolved as those first eukaryotes, as those, let me get start over. When the two prokaryotes merged together, that was the beginnings of um, eukaryotic cells. And the endomembrane system evolved in a response to those two cells living together, the archaean and the bacteria. So, and they're also connected either directly or indirectly through transport vesicles. Whereas mitochondria and chloroplast, their origins are they were once free living cells. So they are, because they were once free living cells, they're not part of the endomembrane system. Okay. How do warm water fish and cold water fish regulate fluidity and permeability of their membrane? All right. Well, I, I covered that once briefly, but just remember this. The warmer your water is, the more fluid your membranes are going to be. Because, I mean, just think about bacon grease, right? You put bacon grease in a frying pan, you heat it up really high, it gets really, really liquid. You cool it down, it becomes more and more solid. You can even put olive oil in uh, the freezer and it will actually freeze too but at room temperature, it's liquid. So as you cool off a membrane, it loses permeability. So the, what, what animals and organisms do is as you get in warmer and warmer environments, you make your fatty acid tails longer and longer and more and more saturated because that increases your, your, your van der Waals interactions, what kind of stabilizes it. As you get colder and colder and colder, your fatty acid tails become shorter and more and more Sat unsaturated. You get the carbon double bonds and the cis transformations in there, or cis formation. Okay, differences between archaea and bacteria. Uh, that's a really good question for Mr. Google there. Basically, the differences are in the membranes, and I haven't really gone into the other differences, but there are differences in the, the structure of the ribosomes, even though they have small and large subunit. There's some differences there and there's some differences in some of the proteins involved with the uh, uh, organizing of the DNA. And like I said, the big difference is in their, their membranes. And that's what you need to know here. Okay. Josh Gann, with the secret to life, why is it not just carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus that makes an organism complex or alive? Why the same thing that makes up us humans is also in a rock and obviously not living? I'm not, okay, so let me see if I can answer this. I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. Let me take a crack at this. Okay, the secret to life, according to me, is this process called chemiosmosis. I've talked about that before. Chemiosmosis is basically where every cell has these transport chains that pumps hydrogen across a membrane and then there's a protein called ATP synthase 
Oh, now I see why everything was backwards. My camera is recording things backwards. Huh. Okay. And these protons flow through here through chem in the, as they push their way through the ATP synthase. That's called um, chemiosmosis. And that takes ADP plus a phosphate and makes ATP. Hmm. Well, I guess I need to fix those settings on my camera. Okay. That's the secret to life. And the reason why is because basically every cell on this planet makes ATP, the energy currency of life, doing chemiosmosis. Now, the difference between you, me, and a rock and some other complex organic molecules like a nucleic acid or something is that life is an emergent property. Okay, Think about it this way. At our, at our most basic level, every single one of us are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Well, those have very set properties, but they come together to make elements. We have 92 elements based on the combinations of protons and neutrons and electrons, and each element has slightly different properties. Then you take the elements like carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen. You can take uh, these elements and combine them into almost unlimited number of molecules, and each of those molecules have different properties compared to the individual elements and the individual elements have different properties compared to their different building blocks of the protons, neutrons, and electrons. So in each level of complexity, we get new properties. So eventually life is an emergent property. It's a result of a, well, it's an emergent property of a complex system. So that's what makes us more, you know, different or that what makes us different from a rock is because we're, we're way more complex. We have a lot more going on, even though rocks have the same minerals in us, they're not doing the same things as us. Okay. Okay, Jack Rogers. Can you explain why mitochondria can be considered the defining character of a eukaryotic cell from an evolutionary point of view? Uh, that's a great question, actually. And in fact, um, I've had people get mad at me when I'm like, no, the defining character of, of uh, eukaryotes is actually the mitochondria because I mean, eukaryote even means new kernel. They were named after having the nucleus. But archaeans and bacteria are both prokaryotic cells. Neither one had a nucleus. And when that bacteria merged into that archaean, the, the bacteria eventually evolved into the mitochondria. So the point is the mitochondria came first and was a defining moment in the evolution of eukaryotic cells. It was the nucleus that actually evolved in response to the mitochondria, right? This, I mean, as a mitochondria allowed these cells to grow larger and more complex and have this endomembrane system and the cytoskeleton and the need for a cell nucleus. So while every eukaryotic cell does have a cell nucleus, and we consider that the defining character of, of eukaryotic cells, but from an evolutionary point of view, it was a nucleus that evolved in response to the mitochondria that allowed for the entire evolution of eukaryotic cells. Okay, I hope that answered that question. Destiny. Why a concentration gradient represents lower entropy, but a system in equilibrium has higher entropy? Okay, let me just step back for a second. We have two laws of thermodynamics that are really important for life. The first one, energy can't be created or destroyed. That's great. That means, you know, we're never going to run out of energy. Yeah, that's not right at all. It means that the energy is always constant in the universe. But then we have that pesky second law of thermodynamics. And that second law of thermodynamics says every time you use, use energy, entropy increases. Now, entropy is a measure of disorder. What it means is, the higher the entropy, the more disordered the system is. And the universe wants to go to high entropy. High entropy is also equilibrium. So if you look at my bookshelf in the back, the books are kind of ordered. They have a little bit of order. They would have low entropy. If I had my books just randomly distributed, then, um, then that would be high entropy. But I actually, if you look really closely, you can see I have all my bird books next to my fish books next to my lizard books. Or we could look at a flask. And we put all the solutes on one side here. Okay. Now this system is out of equilibrium. I've got more solutes on one side than the other. 
this would represent low entropy. Like a living system, oh, I need to stop writing. Um, a living system is low entropy. That's why I said we're, we're islands of low entropy because we create and maintain order. What happens is this, the universe doesn't like this. So these things want to diffuse down their concentration gradient until they're all equal on the same side. And in this case, now we have high entropy. And once you reach equilibrium, these molecules are, or these solutes are moving back and forth in equal, equal amounts. And you can't do any work once the system's in equilibrium. But if you're in a system that's out of equilibrium and you've got like some type of facilitated uh, or some channel protein here, you can harness these things going down their concentration gradient to do work. Okay? So systems out of equilibrium like you, you never want to be in equilibrium with your environment, have low entropy, and systems in equilibrium have high entropy. They're totally disordered. You can use a system out of equilibrium to do work. You can harness that potential energy, and that's exactly what life does. And life has to use energy to, like, you know, create all these pro electrochemical gradients. So we can use that to do work and stay out of equilibrium with the environment. Okay, Anderson, can you help, can you describe the purpose of the SRP receptor on the rough ER? Okay, that's a good question. Signal recognition particle, it's a protein. All the ribosomes in a cell are floating around in the cytoplasm, okay? When messenger RNA comes out of the nucleus, it's going to immediately bind to a ribosome and it will start to translate the information in that messenger RNA into a protein. So, you know, like I said, the, the RNA comes out of the cell, out of the cell nucleus, binds to a ribosome and wants to immediately begin uh, translation. However, if the protein is going to stay inside the cytoplasm, that's fine. But if you've got to export this protein out of the cell, embed it into a membrane, or get it into another organelle, then you don't want to just translate it right into the cytoplasm. So an SRP, a signal recognition particle, is a unique protein that recognizes a sequence of nucleotides and says, I'm going to bind to you, and it stops translation in the cytoplasm. Then what it does, not only does it halt translation, it waits until it reaches the, uh, the docking molecule along the rough ER, and allows the ribosome to come down and dock to that. And then once that happens, then translation will begin, but then translation will translate the protein into the rough ER. And then inside the rough ER, there's all the appropriate proteins that can help fold the protein you're making into a new protein. And then it can be, of course, you know, packaged and shipped and sent to the Golgi, and then it goes to wherever it needs to be. Okay. My daughter's knocking at the door. Okay, what is the other organelle besides mitochondria that is used for energy conversion? Chloroplast. Your two energy converting mo molecules, I mean molecules, organelles are mitochondria and chloroplast. And if you remember, we acquired both of them through endosymbiosis. Okay, Adriana. Using evolution, explain why all eukaryotic cells are similar at the molecular level. That's another fantastic question. You know, I mean, we we focus on learning the difference between plant and animal cells, and then we're like, oh, yeah, there's these prokaryote bacteria over here. Well, bacteria can live in, like, boiling water. They can live in freezing water. They can live in battery acid. They can live in frozen rocks in the Arctic. They can do aerobic respiration. They can do anaerobic respiration. They can break down plastics. They can eat rocks. They are very diverse, metab metabolically speaking. Now, so, eukaryotic cells, we all have to do cellular respiration. Every Basically, every eukaryotic cell has to do that. There's a few parasite exceptions. But we all package our proteins, right, through the endomembrane system. We all have the Golgi. We all have the rough and smooth ER, right? We've got a cell nucleus that regulates what comes in and out of the nucleus. We have DNA that's in the form of chromatin. 
So a lot of the way that a plant cell works versus an animal cell is really similar. I mean, we all make proteins the same way. We regulate DNA kind of the same way. And we're kind of limited in what we can use in our environment. Okay. Okay, compare and contrast phagocytosis and autophagy and eukaryotes. You know, a good way to answer that question is just to go to the uh, Wikipedia, the, the greatest website in the history of humanity. And when you go to Wikipedia, just type in phagocytosis and then type in uh, autophagy. And you'll, and you'll quickly learn that autophagy is where you use a lysosome to um, um, break, to like digest the organelles inside of your cell. So you're recycling things inside the cell. And phagocytosis is bringing things into the cell for digestion, but they both involve recycling of materials. What other organelles have to do with aging process? Almost all of them, actually. The mitochondria do, the lysosomes, the rough ER. I mean, over time, we, we accumulate all this uh, oxidative damage and even your ER doesn't start to work so well, and you don't, you start misfolding proteins. So as we get older, we get all these not only just oxidative stress, we get misfolded proteins as well. Okay, Maxwell, how does phosphorylation represent a transfer of potential energy? Well, phosphate groups goes to help to know what they look like. So phosphate has all these oxygens attached to it. Oxygens are incredibly electronegative. Some of these have even lost their, their protons. They're what we say, we're deprotonated. They have all these negative charges. Okay, you stick this on a molecule that has nitrogen or oxygen, and it's gonna repel, it's gonna repel those functional groups and those elements. So as a result, by sticking phosphate onto these molecules, they start repelling all the other hydroxyl groups, carboxyl groups, carbonyl groups, and that actually represents an increase in potential energy. And phosphorylating molecules is very important for a couple of reasons. One, if you phosphorylate like a glucose molecule, think of glucose, it's got five hydroxyl groups on there. You stick a phosphate group on there, that phosphate is going to repel all those hydroxyl groups and make that molecule have more potential energy, which makes it easier to break those bonds. And in fact, that's the very first step of cellular respiration. Phosphorylation is also important for changing the shape of a lot of molecules. So all of your sodium potassium pumps and a lot of your proton pumps, not all your proton pumps, just some of them, and your calcium pumps, they are going back and forth between two shapes. Phosphate on, phosphate off, phosphate on, phosphate off. Motor proteins that walk like this, right? The, you know, phosphate on, phosphate off, phosphate on, phosphate off. So by adding a phosphate group, not only add potential energy, you can cause a, the protein to change shape as in a motor protein or a pump. You can also turn those proteins on or off. And when you get to chemical signaling right after um, the break, you'll realize that phosphorylation is really event for activating chemical signaling inside themselves. How transport vesicles move between the rough ER and the Golgi apparatus? There's a motor protein attached to it that walks right down to microtubules. Okay, Jack again. Oh gosh. That's a big question. Describe the roles of mitochondria, lysosomes, or rough ER, and oxidative damage to the aging process. That's a bit much for one simple question. Uh, it has to do with um, autophagy, or for mitochondria, it has to do with the reactive oxygen species causing oxidative damage. Lysosomes have to do with um, autophagy, the rough ER causing misfolded proteins and, uh, and, and damaged proteins as well. I talked about that a lot in class, actually. Go back to your notes and... Uh, you can actually look some of that stuff up on the web, too. Okay, what is the evidence for a single ancestor for all life and the evidence for two ancestors for archaean bacteria? Okay, I think I know what you're asking. Every living thing on this planet is descended from one population of cells as far as we know. 
we see that because the, the genetic code is the same. So not only do we use the same DNA, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, the same four basic uh, building blocks, but the, the letters are the same and the code is the same. So AAA, adenine, adenine, adenine will always code for the exact same amino acid in every living organism on the planet. So not only are we using the same letters, we use the same words in life. So that comes from a common ancestor. We have uh, messenger RNA, tRNA, ribosomal RNA. Um, the transcription translation is the same. We share things like glycolysis with every cell. We make proteins in a ribosome. Um, yeah, so all of these things represent a common ancestor. We use the same 20 amino acids that are all left-handed, of course. But when it comes to the cell membrane of these things, there's a bit of difference. Uh, you have enantiomer, so both of, even though we both use phospholipids, one's a left-handed, one's a right-handed form, one's a left-handed form, which would require different enzymes to make. Archaeans use isoprenoid tails instead of a fatty acid tail, and Archaeans also have a different type of bond holding it on. They have a, um, was called an ether bond, which is carbon, oxygen, carbon, and then it goes down like this. And then, and so this is an ether bond. And then in you, uh, bacteria, they have what is called an ester bond. And that's important because this is more stable than this. this these bonds have less potential energy than this one. So having this ester bond and these isoprenoid tails uh, also help stabilize their membranes in these really extreme environments. So we think because of the, of the difference between those membranes that they clearly evolved their metabolism similarly. In terms of their DNA, the proteins, glycolysis, making proteins and ribosomes, they all use chemiosmosis to make ATP but their membranes are really different in terms of how they're made. And a lot of scientists speculate they, they have two different origins for those membranes. Okay. Alyssa, in the RNA world theory, the RNA is made from the spontaneous combination of nucleic acid. But from this, how does it evolve into cells? Alyssa, that is exactly the question I have. How do you go from self-replicating RNA to a cell? And in fact, that is the big limitation of that theory is that nobody's able to like really figure that out. And in class, I said, you know, life is a system out of equilibrium. That's important. Uh, life uses energy from the environment. It extracts energy from the environment to create order. And you do that through metabolic processes. So that's why I believe in the metabolism first theory, even though the RNA world theory is great because your RNA is replicating around, it can facilitate some chemical reactions. How do you go from a few nucleotide like thing to a system out of equilibrium? I, I see no way to make that leap. So you have the same question I do. <laughs> My daughter's knocking at the door. What is six by nine? Oh, the answer is 42. That, you know, the answer for the 42 is everything in the universe, right? The answer is always 42. That's a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy reference. I hope, Chad, that that's a joke. Okay. Mia Speckled Rock. And the practice questions for, C, for chapter six, it mentioned what you call the secret to life and how does this relate to cellular transport? Okay, the secret to life is chemiosmosis. It's even in my book that I wrote about. It's uh, The reason why I say chemiosmosis and secret to life is because all life must have energy to create order, maintain homeostasis, and to grow, reproduce, and do all the other list of characteristics that Freeman talks about. And the fact that every single cell on this planet makes ATP through chemiosmosis because it's efficient and we use ATP as the energy currency of life, then this chemiosmosis is very important. And let me explain it really quick. 
And just a heads up to everybody, I'm going to have to probably go around 7 o'clock. Okay, let's talk about Kimi osmosis for just a second. So every cell has an electron transport chain. It's a series of proton pumps. And what those proton pumps do, I'm going to draw four of them, getting you right prime for a cellular respiration, is they pump protons across a membrane. Okay, this is active transport. I'm creating an electrochemical gradient. Chemical because I got more hydrogen out, ions out of here. Uh, chemical because, sorry, chemical because I got more hydrogen ions. Electrical because I'm building up a positive charge on this side. Okay, so that's active transport. And then uh, cellular respiration and then chemiosmosis in general. The energy for this actually comes from electrons. Sorry, that's backwards, but it comes from electrons. Okay, so now that we've created an electrochemical gradient, the cell is now storing energy, potential energy across this membrane, and it can use it to do work. The other thing is that ATP synthase, okay? This system is out of equilibrium. The universe hates being out of equilibrium, but these are protons. They can't cross this membrane because these are ions, right? They, they don't cross the, the, the membrane, which is the, the hydrophobic interior. So we got ATP synthase over here, and it will facilitate their diffusion across the membrane. All right. So and then that makes this energy, this conversion of potential energy to kinetic energy as they go through here, the cells harness that using ATP synthase to phosphorylate ADP into ATP. Okay, so the, the role of transport here is we're, we're coupling active transport to facilitated diffusion. Okay, I hope I, I got that. And like I said, the source of, of, of energy here is not uh, ATP like it is for almost every other pump is electrons. And if you're a prokaryotic cell, you're doing chemiosmosis right across your, your outer membrane. If you are a eukaryotic cell, You've got these mitochondria, and the mitochondria, of course, are doing it across their inner membrane. And, you know, eukaryotic cells can be jammed full of mitochondria. Okay. Okay, that was uh, related to cellular transport. Oh, I keep losing my place here. Adding a phosphate group as potential who's a highly negative charge is a phosphate group. There are two negative. Thank you. How do transport vesicles move between rough ER? Wait, I think I missed some questions here. Huh. What is the difference between evidence supporting separate origins? Okay. Man, I really lost this. My computer jumped, the, the, the top chat went all over the place on me here. Okay, the secret of life, name the process, what makes a difference in relation to cellular transport? All right, guys, I've said that a couple of times. Secret of life is chemiosmosis. Okay, the purer the water, the higher the water potential, adding salt. Oh, thank you. Let's see here. Where does the, so Kyle, where does the energy come from in passive transport? Transport. Okay, in passive transport, something's going from areas of low concentration to high concentration. If you're in water or in air, the air molecules are moving all around. Water molecules are moving all around. They're, they all have kinetic energy. So the energy that's already in the system, that is where that energy comes from. All right. So you, like I said, you don't have to add any, any in there. Okay. Explain the difference between an ion channel and a carrier protein and facilitated diffusion. So an ion channel, think of like a, a pipe. Um, going underneath the driveway, right? It, it creates a conduit for water to flow through. Ion channels are really similar, and they have different shapes to allow things like calcium, sodium, potassium, chlorine to go through. Okay. And you can actually open and close those gates, too. That's why they're called a gated ion channel. But uh, um, a carrier protein, they rely on either moving through the membrane or they change shape and help pull things through the membrane like um like a glucose molecule 
okay, how does a cell use an electrochemical gradient? I, that um, example I just gave on facilitated diffusion for making uh, ATP through chemiosmosis, that would be an example of how cells use it in electrochemical gradient. They can also use it for transport as well. And uh, I'm going to stop there with that. What is the difference between the evidence supporting a single ancestor to all life to the evidence supporting a separate origins for the cellular membranes and archaean bacteria? I just went over that, and it has to do with uh, the difference in the tails. One uses fatty acid tails, one uses isoprenoids, one has an ester bond, one has an ether bond, and they're enantiomers. They're, one is a right-handed form and one is a left-handed form. And it would require a completely different, uh, or, uh, but completely different metabolic pathways and enzymes to create the two lipids for each one of these archaeans and bacteria. So it's unlikely that they um, one evolved from the other. We we think they actually because of the extreme differences that they evolved twice. Two organelles used for energy conservation conversion, uh, mitochondria chloroplast. Okay. How does energy production limit eukary prokaryotic cell size? That's actually the very beginning of this, but it has to do with uh, prokaryotes make all their ATP across their outer membrane. As they get larger and larger and larger, they produce less ATP compared to their volume because surface area only gets larger at the square root, whereas volume gets larger at, to the third power. So as they get larger, they run out of energy. It does not have to do with the fusion. Okay. Using evolution to explain why all eukaryotic cells are similar at the molecular level. Uh, we make proteins really similarly. We, re we organize our DNA really similarly. We regulate the DNA. We organize it. We replicate it all about the same way. And that's because all eukaryotic cells have a single common ancestor that dates back about 2 billion years, whereas bacteria and archaea, gosh, they do everything. That's also back at the beginning of this uh, talk as well. Describe three hypotheses for abiogenesis. Okay, that's a little bit much of a question for me to answer all at once, especially what you need to do when you see something like a question like that is Google um, Miller-Urey experiment, the prebiotic soup, uh, Google, Google the RNA world hypothesis, and then Google the metabolism uh, first theory. But basically the prebiotic soup is uh, they took um, – simple molecules and they sparked it and see what kind of um, um, organic molecules they get out of very simple molecules. The RNA world hypothesis uh, is based on self-replicating RNA that can facilitate chemical reactions and also carry genetic information. And the metabolism first theory says, you know, life got started as a system out of equilibrium in a series of complex chemical reactions using energy from the environment to create order. And of course, um, each one of these theories has their benefits, um, and each one has severe problems. So like the Miller-Urey experiment was like, yeah, how do you get a system out of equilibrium? I mean, you're not going to ever get a cell crawling out of a flask with a bunch of organic molecules. RNA world hypothesis, yeah, that's awesome. You found a self-replicating molecule. How do you go from self-replicating molecule to a system out of equilibrium, whereas metabolism first theory actually addresses those issues, but still like, we don't know how uh, cells go from um, having their membranes and DNA replication and basically leave their nursery grounds of some metabolically active rock to free living cells. We still don't know how that happens yet. So still got more to learn. But the metabolism first theory is so far, it's like the most comprehensive theory, the best theory, and it solves the problems of the miller Urey and the, and the RNA world hypothesis. Okay, I got another question. It's just a uniporter, symporter, antiporter. Questions like this, all powerful, all knowing Google. It will pop up and it will give you the answers almost immediately. Uniporters are you're moving a solute in one direction. A symporter, they're going in the same direction. Antiporter, they're going in opposite directions. And this can both be facilitated diffusion coupled to active transport. Like I said, uh, on questions like that, just you can just go to Google, and I mean, there's so many places to find something like that. Okay, here's a good question. Just to clarify, the cytoskeleton came after the mitochondria. Now, that's a good question because you can't easily find that on the Google machines. And the answer to that is, yes, the eukaryotic cytoskeleton, actin filaments, microtubules, 
and keratin fibers. Those are unique to eukaryotic cells. So they absolutely came after the origins of mitochondria. Okay, here's another good question. Um, not Tila, Tequila. Can you go over the nuclear envelope structure and why it's important? That's a good question. Okay, the nuclear envelope, the way we always learn it in our, in our textbooks is it's a double membrane structure studded with all of these nuclear pores. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times I saw a nuclear envelope diagram like this. There's one membrane and there's a second one. That's what chloroplasts look like. Chloroplasts have, you know, two membranes. And uh, that's how they often, that's how I learned the nuclear envelope. The nuclear envelope is a series of these flattened sacs. And they're stitched together by proteins. So you still have your double membrane. Okay. But what happens is you've got all your DNA in here. And when you replicate your, when you're going to go through cell division, you've got to duplicate your cell. I mean, duplicate all your DNA. You condense your DNA into chromosomes. And then the cytoskeleton involving the microtubules is called the mitotic uh spindle apparatus, the mitotic spindle, has to take all these chromosomes and line them up in the middle of the cell. So here I am lining up all my chromosomes in the middle of the cell. So you've got microtubules are doing this. But if your cell, if you're, all your chromosomes are inside of a nucleus, well, how do you get the microtubules in there? Well, it turns out that during cell division, you need the nucleus to disassociate. You need to disassemble. And so you, as part of your cell replication, you cleave all these proteins here and the cell, the nuclear envelope can be pulled apart. And then when you pull your, your chromosomes apart into two different daughter cells down here, then your nuclear envelope can easily reassemble. You, you don't want to re release something called a, a lipase because a lipase will just dissolve all your membranes. And you don't want that. You just want to pull it apart disassemble it, and then reassemble it at the end of cell division. So that's why it's a double membrane structure, but it's really a series of flattened stacks, and it does not look like that. Good question. Okay. Oh, I like this question. Could the primordial soup theory and RNA hypothesis be considered just starting points for the metabolism theory, and therefore they are all kind of one theory? You know what? I wouldn't call them all one theory because they're, they they came about independently, but they are they they are absolutely building our story of how we think we got li or how we think life got started through abiogenesis. Uh, you you that was very insightful because the prebiotic soup theory showed that organic molecules are easily made. The building blocks to life, all you need is a couple things like ammonia, oxygen. I mean, uh, I mean, water, uh, methane, carbon dioxide. Take these very simple molecules, add a little bit of energy, and in no time, hours, you already have the building blocks to life. So that added to it. The RNA world theory adds to our story because it goes, you know what? RNA can store genetic information, and it can facilitate chemical reactions. And uh, so that explains, like, how um, genetic information probably got started to being stored and where replication comes from and later and DNA came later. So absolutely those those theories combined with the metabolism theory help paint the picture of how life got started. So I wouldn't call them all one theory, but they definitely each one added to our body of knowledge. That was insightful. Okay. Chad, adding a phosphate group to molecule as potential energy because of the highly negative charges on the phosphate group, there are two negative Yes, that is exactly right. What? I lost my place again. Okay. How do transport vesicles move between the ER? Uh, basically, what you're doing is you you have motor proteins that uh, walk right down microtubules, and that what carries these things. They're not just randomly drifting around. 
Aging is a complicated process. There's no one reason why we age. Describe the roles of money. I think we've already talked about that. How does kidney osmosis relate to cellular transport? I think I already discussed that one in depth, actually, that the electron transport chains that are pumping protons Like I said, you've got every cell has an electron transport chain that does active transport of pumping protons across a membrane. And then ATP synthase allows those protons to flow through. So we've got active transport over here creating a proton gradient, specifically an electrochemical gradient. And then that stores energy, which is then as you store the energy, they, they go through the ATP synthase through facilitated diffusion. And that's how cells make ATP. Okay, do you want us to just know who Gandalf is, or do you – he is as well, or do you want what he is as well? Ah, okay, so what I'm going to do is um, when I get the TAs, and they're going to have the bonus questions to grade, the more information you can give about Gandalf or the more you can talk about the Balrogs and the Istari, the more likely you're going to get full points. If you just say Gandalf is a wizard, uh, you, you, you have a point. So if you really want to get your two bonus points, you'll have to do a little bit of research on Gandalf. Okay, my question. I'm not, both to my question, not sure. Okay, how does the metabolic first theory refute, support or refute abiogenesis? Well, we know abiogenesis happened. Hold on one second. I'll be right back. Hey, if you need to go, it'll be all right, sweetie. Okay. I'm just gonna, I'm still going. I'll just take Lily. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. Hi, Lily. There's 52 people. You're immortalized forever on YouTube now. Say hi. Hi. All right. So the uh, the uh, the prebiotic suit model doesn't refute abiogenesis. I mean, we know abiogenesis happened because well, life is here, and we know that. Life had to come from non-life at some point, so um, it doesn't refute it. It actually shows that um, that the building blocks of life are really easy to make. But what the prebiotic soup theory does not do is show us like how we actually get a cell from organic molecules. Okay, Gandalf is Magneto. Um, that is actually quite correct. Uh, that was a great character. I really liked him in, in the, as, as a Magneto. He was a great bad guy, but he wasn't all that bad. He was just a little misunderstood. But if you want to get credit for this, I would, uh, I would look up like who the Meyer are in the Astari and who Valor, who the Valor are and who Manway is. Okay. LDL versus HDL. Difference in structure and function. Also, thanks for doing this. Hey, you're welcome. Oh, no, Lily. All right, all right. You can go out and walk around a little bit. Okay. I guess she's going to learn a lot of science over the years. Oh, those are my dogs coming in. Like I said, after an hour, they get they got to know what I'm up to. 